Perik Yud Gimel, Pasuk Yud Gimel. Okay, which is right on top of our page anyway. Okay, no, not you. Hold on. There you go. All right, everybody. You know, um, welcome everybody. First of all, good Chodesh. It's Chodesh ER. You know, I did I want everybody to realize, which I guess you probably do, that we give out handouts, but that doesn't mean we're not learning inside the Chumash, inside the text. I've just taken the Pesukim from the Chumash and put them on the handout. But they're all straight out, you know, from the Parsha we're learning. So, um, so uh, you could also look at it in a Chumash and you'll feel like you're learning the Parsha as opposed to hearing a philosophy class. <laughs> All righty. Well, we're going... This, uh, it came handy during the time uh, when we were not here. There you got the... That what? We got the... Oh, right. So we started getting the notes. That's right. Now, um, our class today is called Anatomy of Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara. Oh. And we are starting with uh, an idea that is from my grandfather Safer, and uh, we're going to go through a couple of psukim, linking together psukim and ideas that you already know about Lashon Hara from all your years of learning. When we think about Lashon Hara and the examples of Lashon Hara in the Torah, which two examples, <laughs> glaring examples, come to our mind? Miriam, Miriam and Miraglim, of course. All right. So but our parsha is uh, our two parshios this, this week are Tazria and Mitzorah. And after the first topic, which is about Tuma, uh, when a woman gives birth, we shift into the topic of Tzoras, okay, which is a lot of, the, you know, the or half of Tazria and a lot of Mitzorah is all Tzoras. Now, this, this disease, right, what is it not? Leprosy. It's not leprosy, okay. What is it? Some type of odd spiritual uh, disease that only took place when we were in Eretz Yisrael, when we had a, when we had the Shechina among us, when we had a Mishkan, or we had a Beis Hamikdash. It doesn't exist anymore, Tzaras. It has very strange conditions, very counterintuitive conditions, which we're going to focus on one of them right now. It's not contagious, all right. And how does a person con? Track this disease by speaking Lashon Hara. Okay, <laughs> by speaking Lashon Hara. Who is the classic example? Someone who spoke Lashon Hara and got Saras? Yeah. Miriam. We're going to define, of course, what Lashon Hara is. You get this disease by speaking Lashon Hara. Now, the odd thing about this disease is that, and it's very, very complicated. You need some an expert to diagnose it. Generally, it should, it must be, it must be diagnosed by a Kohen. Obviously, a Kohen is in charge of the spiritual condition of the nation, and therefore, the Kohen is the one who, who determines if somebody has saras or not, because it's, it's a spiritual malady. It represents, rather, it's a clear indication of a spiritual malady going on inside a person, and the Kohen di diagnoses it. If the Kohen is not an expert in all the laws of saras, you can have a Talmud Chacham, you know, an expert, identify whether it is or isn't, and whether the person is now Tahar or still Tameh, and tell the Kohen, but the Kohen has to officially, like, you know, sign off on it. Okay, the Kohen has to officially... Does he have to be a doctor? No, it's nothing to do with medicine. So, now, one of the odd things about Saras, okay, it comes in many different colors, and somehow or another a lesion appears on the skin that's white, different shades of white are different halachically, and there's up to sometimes the hairs in the lesion turn white. And uh, it represents that the tzaras white, a white patch on the skin and white hairs. What happens when skin turns white and hairs turn white? What does that mean? That means when skin turns white, when skin turns totally white, what is that? It's dead. Okay, it's called cell death. Okay, necrosis actually it turns into the, the skin turns white. So it indicates. Well, this is this is uh, this is an unusual case. I guess it would be quite complicated to diagnose a ras on, all, uh, on an albino. <laughs> but in any case, um, 
In any case, this, there's an odd halacha here, which we're going to look at now, and that is that when the person, let's say he was Tameh because he had Saras, comes to the Kohen, and that lesion that was you know, growing on his healthy skin is completely, it has eaten all the healthy skin up so that the lesion is entirely white, and there is no healthy skin left to be found in that lesion, then that person is officially de declared to be Tahar. No more, he's, he's Tahar. What is that all about? So let's look in, let's look in the sheets or in your Chumash. Okay, this is Pasuk Gimel, uh, Parakid Gimel, Pasuk Gimel. Barah HaKohen, and the Kohen sees it. Vihine kista hatsarat et kol bisaro. The tsaras has covered the whole body. Now it doesn't always have to be that the entire body, but the lesion, okay, the lesion of that um, you know that they've been that they've been watching is completely white. So what happens? Vatihar es hanaga, he shall pronounce the affected person tahar, okay. Kulo hafach lavan tahar hu. When the he is when he is turned all white, he is tahar. Now, why would that be? Why would that when why, what's the mechanics of this? When the lesion is completely white and there's no more healthy live skin for it to feed on, it's like completely overcome the 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 the, the live skin, it's completely tahar. What is going on? It, you would think it would be totally tummy. No, the process is over. Okay, the process is over. Correct. What process? What the process of the taras? What? The process of the taras feeding off the live skin. There's no more live skin to feed off. It's depleted all of the life that was feeding it, and so now it's it's done. And therefore, the person's tahar. We have another process like this. That what what there is a uh, not paraduma, but in our experience, medically, oh, medically, medically, what happens when there's a parasite feeding off some healthy animal or some healthy part of an animal? What happens when it feeds off the animal completely? When it depletes the animal entirely of its life source? The animal dies and the parasite dies too. When it can no longer deplete its light, when it can no longer feed off a life source, it, it's done, it's over, it's, and it dies. So now, every halacha in the Torah has many, many levels okay, of what it's about, of what it means. So, so Amr of Yitzchak, look at this, Sanhedrin 97a. Ein ben David ba. The, what does this mean? Mashiach will not come until what? On this Pasuk, the Gemara says it. This is the source. Ad shetithapech kol hamalchot leminot. Leminot. Until all the governments, all the empires, are completely corrupt and deny everything, and deny their relation. What does it mean? A person to say, I, this, does, this, this is not from God. They completely cut themselves off from Hashem. Right until that happens, that they're entirely devoid of any any attachment anymore to God. Okay, until that point, Mashiach won't come. Mashiach will only come, in other words, when they all the empires, all the other um, opinions about you know how to set up life here in this world, how to govern, what people need, what's right, what's good, right, what works. Until all that has run its course and there's nothing left, and everybody is. Like there's nowhere to turn, then Mashiach will come. Including well, well, in all malchus, everything that is sheker, everything that is sheker, until it's run its course and it becomes evident that it has no life to feed on anymore. Till that point, we give up on everything. That's until that point, Mashiach can't come. Everything has to basically, you know, wear itself out, play itself out, die, you know, die and have no more source of life. Amar Maikra, that's what it means right here. Vayikra, yugimel, yugimel. Kulo hafach lavan, tahor hu. It's entirely dead, then it's tahor. Okay? So we have a starting out with one principle that sheker eventually depletes itself. It eventually exposes itself as 
not as empty, completely empty, with, and when it's totally empty and totally exposed, as pure sheker, no, there's no embers in it at all, it loses its source of life, and it dies out. Why does sheker, when it's completely exposed as sheker, does it lose its source of, it's, 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 a, it's a host, you know, it's a, what's the word I'm looking, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, 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 no, what it's feeding off. Why does it, it, yeah, it's source of, it's source of life. Why does Sheker deplete itself and is exposed to be zero and die out when it loses its source of life? It seems like a simple question. Because that's what it feeds on. Sheker feeds on a little bit of MS. Okay. Lashen, hold on. Sheker feeds on a little bit of MS, just like the tzaras has to feed on a little bit of healthy skin. When there's no more healthy skin, it's over, and the person's tar. So when there's no more, sh- no more MS for the sheker to base itself on, or validate itself on, or claim to be an expression of, it's, it just implodes on its own, and it crumbles. All right? Now, next. Next. Hmm? Say this again? Now, how do we, what's the perfect example of Sheker that needs a little bit of MS to feed on? A miraglim. So look at the next Pesukim. So they came back, and how did they start? Talking about, and it's a very appropriate to speak about Eretz Yisrael because we're going to learn a very fundamental halacha at the end of this class related to Lashon related to Eretz Yisrael. It's appropriate, first of all, um, First of all, it is uh, these, this time period, despite all the machlokot about having Yom HaShoah in Nisan and having Yom HaTzmoet in Sphira, which are all halachic issues, mm-hmm. all right? Because in Nisan, you're not supposed to make, make hespedim, and in, and in Sphira, you're not supposed to have music. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of issues here. Nevertheless, there's still a halacha, and Yom HaTzmoet is coming up next week. There's still a halacha that we're going to learn about, irregardless of these things, that, uh, and, and it relates to... You know, very relevant to this speaking Lashon about Eretz Yisrael right now. So we saprulo, and they said to him, "Vayomru." They said, "Banu el haaretz asher shalach tanu." Yes, we came to the land that you sent us to, and what? Yes, absolutely. Gam zavat chalav devashi vezepiria. Oh, it's flowing with milk and honey. Look at these incredible fruits. So they start out with shit with emes. Then they say, "What?" Okay. <laughs> And then they say, nice. well, I say, but, well, we're going to see that, we're going to get to later. Then they say, but, da 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 correct? Mm-hmm. Now, because, so what was the reaction of the people? That's oh, they become disheartened, they become desolate, they break down, and the, the whole, whole breakdown, everybody starts to cry, because the message was, despite all the good stuff, this land is unmanageable, unsustainable, we're not going to make it here, we're doomed, this is it, and everybody, okay, and they speak, ultimately they speak terrible Lashon Har Eretz Yisrael, which we will analyze further. Now, this Lashon Hara has an effect, because it's based on MS. It still has MS to feed off. So, however, when it becomes clear eventually that there's no more MS to feed off, it will, as we said, it dies out on its own. Now, let's talk about Sheker. That sheker needs MS to feed off, okay? So, in, in, the, in Gemara Shabbos 104a, the Gemara discusses the whole, the, 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 the high, hidden meanings and messages and symbols and, uh, and, and, and um, Mishalim that the, the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, has b- built within it. So it goes through Aleph, starts with Aleph, Beis, Gimel, and finally gets to the last uh, letters of the alphabet, okay? Kuf, Reish, Shin, which are the backwards, what does it spell? Sheker. 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 Kuf, Reish, Shin, right? You switch, switch it around. They're, the, they're up before the last letter, Tuf, they're the last three letters of the alphabet. So he says like this. Shin, Sheker. Tuf, Truth. MS, so there's two letters of the last two letters, Sheker and Tuf. Tuf is Emet. Okay, the last letter of the word Emet is Tuf, and the first letter of the word Sheker is Shin. Why are the letters of the word sheker adjacent one, to one another in the alphabet, while the, word, the letters of emet are distant from one another? What does it mean the letters of emet are distant from one, one another? Oh, yeah. Aleph is the first, mem mm-hmm. is the middle, and tough is the end. They're spread out. Okay? And sheker is boom, boom, they're right next to each other. Why? There's a reason for this, too. 
right? That is because while falsehood is easily found, clumped together, you find a little bit, you find the whole thing. Okay? You don't have to, once you get a hint of it, you see the whole thing. Truth is found only with great difficulty. You got to persevere. You got to be patient. You got to keep looking. You have to look with the right eyes, right? You have to find it hidden in between a lot of other stuff. And why do the letters that compromise the word checker all stand on one foot? What do they mean by this? Why do they mean they stand on one foot? Well, they have. Think about not this script and not, you know, the, the way it's written in the Torah. The shin comes down to a point. The kuf stands on two points, one, one, you know, the upper point and lower point, and the resh stands on a point. It's not like a base that has a base, it has a flat bottom. Okay, they all stand on points. They teeter. So, it says like this, and why do the letters compromise, uh, here, comprise the word check all stand on one foot, and the letters that compromise the word emmet stand on bases that are wide like bricks. Aleph has two bases. Mem has two ba has a long base. Tough, two bases. Right, why is that? What's the answer? Yeah, the truth is firm and established and eternal. And falsehood does not stand eternally. It teeters and then it falls. Okay? Everybody knows the famous idea, Sheker? Ain lo raglayim. Sheker has no legs to stand on. Sheker ain lo raglayim. You've heard that? That's the, the Gemara is saying the same thing in a little bit different words. Well, to the extent that it's based on MS. Now, it's very interesting. Tell me about Lashon Hara and Raglayim. What's the name of someone who goes around peddling Lashon Hara? Holech Rachil. What else? What about Raglayim? Miraglim. 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 Okay. So what is what are those legs? Those legs of Lashon Hara. We say Sheker Aimbo Raglayim. Yeah, the Sheker has no Raglayim. But the MS that you're basing it on, that's where it gets its uh, uh, seeming credibility. It's got some MS into it. The Miraglims, this is the classic example, they started with MS. All right? We and they said... They, called, they were called something else before they were called Miraglim. They were called Latour. They were really, the Torah doesn't use the word Miraglim. They were as Latour et to to, 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 um, no, no, really to scan out the land, to survey the land, to like go and see it and survey it, to I, I set, assess it. Okay, so we definitely see a classic example of Sheker that has, for it to have some type of substance, just like in Saras, it's got to live off something live, something that's alive. It's got to have some emis in it. But eventually, it, it, it will expose itself to be Sheker. The MS part of it will not be able to be sustained because its motivation is Sheker, its, its desire is Sheker, and, its, and what it's trying to accomplish is Sheker. And eventually, it'll be, a, it'll be clear that the MS is no longer attached to it. They, they can't defend it anymore with the MS. And then it'll be Sheker on itself, and it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll play out its course. And when it plays out its course, and it, it, has no more, it has no more effectiveness then it's tar, okay? What's, let's go further with this, uh, talking about MS, Sheker based on MS, or Lashon Hara. Now, somebody said Lashon Hara is not Sheker. Let's be, let's, that's true, it's, it's, it's actual true facts, but, mo, but what you do with the facts is totally Sheker, okay? So, we'll get to that. So what's the other example? Turn the page to the back. It's a whole different type of Lashon Hara, right? The Tzadaber Miriam Ba'aron B'Moshe. Miriam and Aaron spoke about Moshe. Al odos ha'isha kushes asher lakach regarding the kushay woman he took. Ki isha kushes lakach. Okay, we're not going to go into these pesukim. It's not for now. It's in Bamidbar. Rashi. But tadaber Miriam and Aaron. She started the conversation, so she's mentioned first. Now, what did she say? She what was her lashon hara? So Rashi. Says, so whence did Miriam know that Moshe had separated himself from his wife? For this was a statement she made. Okay, she said, why is Moshe separating from uh, Zipporah all the time? Now, how did she know this? Okay, Rav Nassan answers, Miriam was beside Zipporah when it was told to Moshe that Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. All right, go look this up to get the background if you're not aware of what this is, but 
Hashem chose more Nevi'im. Hashem allowed Moshe to extend his Nevi'im to others, and there were more Nevi'im now suddenly in Am Yisrael. When Moshe said to Hashem, I can't do this alone. Okay, so there were more Nevi'im. When Zipporah heard that there were more Nevi'im now in Am Yisrael, she said, woe to the wives of these. If they have anything to do with prophecy, for they will separate from their wives, just as my husband has separated from me. So Zipporah says, oi, if they're going to be prophets, this is what's going to happen. Okay. Why wasn't she wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, it was from this, wait, Hashem explains it. Hashem explains it. It was from this that Miriam knew about it. That Moshe had separated from Zipporah. Zipporah never directly said it. She just, now, nah, okay, so she, she said, she didn't say it to Miriam, but she heard her say that. She told it to Aaron. Now, what was the case with Miriam, who had no intention to disparage him? She was saying, do you know that Moshe doesn't, is, is separated from Zipporah? She was punished thus severely. How much more will this be so in the case one who intentionally speaks in disparagement of his fellow? So what about Zipporah? Okay. Now, look at the next. She's not even, it doesn't ever identify her as, as guilty of lashing her. Yeah. Okay, so what happened? Va'anan sar me'al ha'ol. And after they were talking, there was always an Anan. There was always a, the Shechina above the Ohel, where Hashem spoke to us, and that's where they were. Hashem departs. Hashem picks himself up and leaves. And after Hashem leaves, because you can't be in a place where somebody's speaking Lashon Hara, right? you got to walk away, basically. If you can't, right? But he named Miriam Mitzaras Kashelik, and she's as white as snow. By the way, this is not just a nice, a nice adjective, she's white as snow. If you look in the Parsha of Taras, as we started before, there's four different shades of white, and they indicate four different levels of severity, and one of the levels is Shelig and Rav Hirsch, if you ever want to get this stuff organized in your head, all these details, you go to Rav Shamshafal Hirsch. He lays it out, he goes through it like detail by detail. So, he, she's so, Mataras Kashalig. Yeah. So if she's supposed to walk away from Wait, here in Lashanara, why didn't Aaron get Saras? Okay, so there's a lot of good questions. Why didn't the Maraglim get Saras? Let's. Why let, did that? Okay. Well, the, first of all, probably it says she she started, and also it wasn't clear lashon hara. This is we have to talk about this in a second. She didn't say lashon hara. Look what Rashi just said. She had no intention to disparage him. She just said a statement about him. Oh, he he separates from his wife, and she loved him and she was proud of him and she cared about him and she was the one who saved his life. And because of Miriam, Moshe existed, and so she wasn't trying to put him down. She was just like curious, like in a, some, in some level critical, like well, why is he doing? Well, why is he doing this? Well, I, I'm a Nevi'ah, and it, I don't have to separate from my, from my uh, husband. What, what, why is he taking his extra madriga? She's like questioning him. But wait, we have to see what Hashem says. Mit- Miriam was Mitzora Kasheli. Okay, but Anansar, look at this Rashi, and only afterwards, be- Miriam became leprous. A parable. Okay. This may be compared to a king who says to his son's tutor, chastise my son, but do not do so until I go away because I feel pity for him. Okay? So Hashem leaves, and because he, okay, now, look at the next passage. This is the Torah coming to Moshe's defense, and it, it, it sets the stage for what's going on here. Ba'ish Moshe, anav ma'od, mikol ha'adam asher al pnei ha'adama. He calls Moshe an adam al pnei ha'adama. Moshe was very, very humble. More than any of anybody who ever walked this earth, he was humble. Now, what's happening here? We don't know yet what's happening here. Why Miriam got it? Why this is called Lashonara? Why Tzipora didn't get it? Let's keep going. After this story comes the story of the Miraglim. All right? We're going now. Here's the command. Shalach lecha anashim v'yaturu et ha'aretz. At Eretz Canaan, sorry, we tour at Eretz Canaan. Send at Anash people who are going to uh, scout out the land. Asher ani notein lebnei Israel that I'm giving to the Jewish people. Isha chadisha chad lamata vosav tishlochu kol nasi b'hem. Okay, Rashi shalach lecha anashim. Why is this section dealing with the spies put in juxtaposition with the section dealing with Miriam's punishment? And until we learn this, we don't really understand what Miriam did. <laughs> to show the grievousness of the spy sins. Now, why? Because Miriam was punished on account of slander, which she uttered against her brother, and these sinners witnessed it, and yet they did not take a lesson her, lesson her. Stop. So, Miriam, first of all, let's say what she said, which was questioning Moshe's behavior and wondering if uh, he was overdoing it. Like, okay, he gets Nevoa, but he has to always separate from his wife and be in a state of... Why did he separate from his wife? To be in a constant state of tara. To be in a constant state of purity, no, 
nocturnal emissions and all these issues, the things that could get a person uh, tame for even for set, even for just you know the span of the of one day, he couldn't he couldn't risk any of that. He was in constant communication with Hashem. Okay, so even if she's saying, um, okay, he's overdoing it. I'm in Nevia, and I, I, I don't have to do this. Or these, you know, even if she's critical of him, even if she's not lying about him or trying to hurt him, it's um, she's taken to task. So then the Maraglim who speak Lashon Hara and say really negative things about Israel, but the land of Israel, should have learned from Miriam. Is there any parallel between the Maraglim saying that the land of Israel is too hard to conquer and it's and it's over and we're not gonna be able to manage and we're all gonna we might as well, we might as well not even try because the land of Israel is 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 just too it's too aggressive, it's too overwhelming, it's got it's too demanding. Uh, it has that anything to do with Miriam saying, why is Moshe being so strict with himself? What is the parallel? First of all, Miriam is speaking about, here's the first part, a human being. Okay? And the Miraglim are speaking about sticks and stones, rocks and trees. Okay. The Miraglim are speaking about rocks and trees. But didn't he also say that they didn't they also say about the giants there? Yeah. But they said the people are good. They were talking about the giants. They were just stating facts. There are giants there. But then it said Eretz Ochelet hmm? Yeshva. But the Moraglam gave a personal opinion, whereas Miriam did. But they gave a personal opinion on rocks and trees, a land, not in people. <laughs> it was a lot of that Moshe was from Adama, from from the earth, and the earth is the beginning of all. Of all. Take it carefully. Is Eretz Yisrael an inanimate object? No. no. It's eres zavat chalav v'dvash. It's flowing with milk like a cow, milk and honey. Okay, honey from the it's it's flowing. It's not an inanimate object. That's the mistake. Eretz Yisrael is not rocks and trees. They're not domain. Remember last week we talked about domain, inanimate objects. Aaron was not an inanimate object when he chose not to utter a word and just be makabel Hashem's gezera. That was not that he had no feelings and no thoughts, and he was a, a some type of passive, inanimate, uh, what's the word, um, um, you know, mineral. Okay? Eretz Yisrael is not an inanimate object. Not the land, not the trees, not the rocks, not the soil, nothing. It has life to it. And it gives us life. Even the air of Eretz Yisrael. Right? Gives us chachma. And we have a we make a bracha. My grandfather always said this. The, the, the bracha that we make, the alamichya, the language is lechol mepirya ulispoa mitu. It's a mitzvah to eat its fruit because it gives you spiritual qualities. So wait a second. They thought they they were they thought they were speaking Lashnar about an inanimate object, about rocks and trees. And Miriam, now let's make the parallel. Moshe was anav mikol adam asher al pnei ha'adama. What was Moshe? Um, was like the, Aaron. Was the fact that, oh, yeah. that uh, she emphasized Kush, Kushite woman? That, ra- no, no, she was... Uh, she, she was emphasizing that Moshe was conducting himself if she felt too stringently. Separating from his wife when... It wasn't necessary. She didn't have to, and she was a prophetess. But, um, but yes, there's a lot on that also, but we're, that's yeah. for then. But, um, so we now make the parallel. When, Mo, when Miriam spoke about Moshe, okay, how did Moshe conduct himself? Like a domain. Like a domain. What does that mean, like an inanimate object? He was, he was a vessel. He was a total mechabel receiver of everything that Hashem was pouring into him, right? He made himself a makabel. He made himself someone who, who was able to be domed, silent, and receive, and humble. What is a domain? It's humble. It's humble. It doesn't, it doesn't express its own, you know, life force, so to speak. It's, it's able to receive, just like Vayidom Aaron, he's makabel Hashem's gezeris. No, he was silent. 
Moshe conducted himself so silently, so, in other, I wouldn't say, silent about his Kedusha, so, so privately about the Madrega he was in on that, now here we get to the anatomy of Lashonara, Miriam, his sister, and Zipporah, his wife, did not know that Moshe Rabbeinu, unlike every other Navi that ever lived, that's why he's called Av Kol Anavim, was in constant contact with Hashem or Kadosh Baruch Hu. Every other Navi had to go through an extensive preparation phase. They had to prepare themselves, and they had to meditate deeply, and it was, there was training on how to do that and how to do that correctly, and they had to purify themselves. And then when the Navu would start to, to, they had to fall into a sleep, and they had to be laying down. It was like a, some kind of trance-like state. And then the Navua would start to, or they would really try, I wouldn't say descend, they would start to ascend. enter, ascend into a, a world above this world. Their physical body couldn't handle the trauma, and they would start convulsing. <coughs> they would start convulsing, and like almost like what would look like a seizure, because the, the spiritual you know, forces were not, you know, the body was not able to manage them. That was a normal Navi. That's how it was with all the other Nevi'im, all the other Nevi'im. Moshe could talk to Hashem awake, standing on his feet in the middle of the day with no trauma. He was on a completely different level, and nobody knew it because it was completely hidden. He didn't expose that to anybody. So to be on that Madriga required that he couldn't ever be Tomei. When he separated from Zipporah, she didn't get. She didn't know this. He didn't express this to her clearly, or maybe she wasn't able to understand. You know, to perceive such a such a madrega could really be true. And Miriam didn't know it either. Moshe was the most humble of everybody. It was like a domain. Now, here's the anatomy of lashon hara. Number one is okay. We said that it's always based on emes, right? And until it depletes its, uh, its connection to the MS, it, it, it still has some life in it. And that's why it's dangerous, because it's always based on MS. Motsi Shemra is a straight out lie. That's Motsi Shemra is you bring out a bad name, bad <coughs> reputation about a person. That's a sh- total shekher. It's a, a, different, a different sin. The first, this is how it works. We start out with some data and a, a fact. There's a fact. Moshe and Zipporah are separated. Okay? The land produces huge fruit. This person got arrested. Okay? Um, we start out with facts. Just facts. Called data. Okay. The next stage is we, uh, we va- evaluate that data through our own subjective lens. We tell ourselves a story that makes the data make sense. Now, everybody knows that everybody, many people ha- can look at the same data and have very different stories. It all depends on the lens we're looking through. There are people with an eye in Ra, and there are people with an eye in Tov. End of story. The classic Rav Levi Yitzchak Miberditchev looked at data and only saw praise, only saw something praiseworthy about you know, the, the situation. Okay. All right, now, it's doable. Here, the classic example is the Miraglim. Look at the next Pasuk. They're telling the story. We saw these great, these people called the Nephilim. They were the Anakites. Min Nephilim, they were huge, right? Now look what he says. What does that mean? What does that word? And in our own eyes, we were grasshoppers. And, that's, and then he says, V'kein ayinu Oh, yeah, and that's how they saw us, too. <laughs> and that's how they saw us, too. It is a known phenomenon in psychology. And anyone's, you know, we've lived, we know it. How a person sees themselves is how they assume everyone else sees them. If a person sees themselves as worthy, and they walk around confidently, they really, really believe that everybody likes them, everybody's smiling at them, everybody's looking at them positively. And if a person is insecure or they feel like, okay, the classic, they have a 
a pimple on their, you know, a big pimple on their cheek. They are absolutely sure that everybody is looking at them and noticing them and saying, thinking. It's, and in fact, I was just walking, it was, I was, literally, it's just happened. I was walking back from the beach, Shabbos morning early, and I saw, um, I saw my neighbor, but she had like a hood on, so I didn't, I wasn't sure it was her. So then I looked at her a little funny, go, oh, hi. And she goes, I know, I know you're looking at me. It's so weird because I'm wearing this, my, my sweater on my head. I'm like, it were like her jacket was on her head. I'm like, I had no idea. And she was so self-conscious that her jacket was on her head. And I didn't even notice. I just saw that her head was covered. So I looked at her. It wasn't, I have a clue. And, um, and she was sure that I was, you know, she felt, in, you know, insecure about it or whatever, or shy about it. Um, this, this is so classic. We have a lens, and through that lens we interpret data, and it's entirely subjective. And the data is facts, but the story is Sheker. It's our story, right? But it's interesting because Miriam was the one who, in the trial, told her parents yeah, to yeah. get yeah. together. Yeah, she again. loved him. So her, no, no, oh, what I'm saying oh. is she's the one who wanted husbands and wives to cohabit. So to see Moshe, separate yeah. to her in her lens was whatever it is. Weird. One thing she knew, she didn't. She knew some data. She didn't have all the data. She didn't have all the data. Okay, she only knew <coughs> some she data. Mean, it still bothers me that she starts with. Well, we never have all the data. When we get to that parsha, Blinada will talk about that. Okay, <laughs> but she, she said, Moshe's not gonna. He was one of Mikol Adam. He was. He didn't ask Moshe to, ex to defend himself and explain himself. He, 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 and Moshe was the greatest Navi. You know, she didn't. She just made an assumption. She had some data, which is always the case, but not all the data. And because she didn't have all the data, she filled in that empty gap with her assumptions, which is that he's a Navi like me, and I don't have to separate from my wife, my husband. Now, what happens? We tell it. What we 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 look at it through our own lens, which our <laughs> lens is. How do we fashion our lens? How is our lens created? It's a combination of a lot of stuff, our personality, our experiences, messages we got, choices we made. It's, it's, it's how we get our lens is a whole, a whole life. It's, it's the story of our life and who we are and the choices we make and our, and our self-knowledge and our, our, our values. I mean, but we, we build a lens for ourselves. So then what happens? Then there's the story we tell ourselves. We have data, we have our lens, and we tell ourselves the story. Where does the sin come in? Then we impose our story on others. <laughs> we impose our story on others. So, right? Some people say, I don't see it that way. I don't agree with you. But some people say, oh, that's interesting. I never <coughs> thought about it that way. And then some people say, you know, you have a point there. I like the way you're seeing it. Right? Well, it depends. Her lens here in this story. Her lens Miriam is. It's just said. He's, this is what he's doing. And she was critical of it. Why but is she, she separating? Yeah, I don't see a lens. I just see the lens that. means the, the lens is things. she was judging Moshe that he was over overdoing it by having to separate from his wife. She made an assumption that was critical of Moshe. It wasn't flat out lush and hara. Miriam was Miriam. Okay. For Miriam, this was a big, huge sin. She was she loved Moshe. She saved, gave her life for him practically, and she uh, she just wasn't hostile trying to hurt him. She was just being critical of him, judging him unfairly because of her lack of data. Her lens was what she knew from her own experience. That's a lens she saw through, and she uh, imposed that standard, which was much lower, on Moshe. It's one thing to. Say it to yourself. That's right. It's another thing to pass it on to That's someone right. else. Correct. That's what That's she correct. Have done. Maybe there was correct. an important point by passing it on to our own. She had just heard it and stopped. I wonder yeah, if that was right. Just she's saying, passing time. it on. So really, checking out Shidduchim then, in theory, is just a waste of time because you're dealing with people's lenses. Well, listen, you have to be so careful. We have to be so so <laughs> careful right. about lashon hara. On the one hand, you can't be a fool and ignore. There, there is some data that people should know. On the other hand, you have to, the interpretations of that data is so subjective. Be so careful. But yeah, but you don't ignore the data. But you also don't buy the person's narrative <coughs> entirely about that data. 
So it, but you have to know data. By the way, what's the classic example and the wrong way to handle things of a, of a leader who refused to hear the data, the information? He refused to hear the information, to accept it. Gedalia ben Achikam. They came to him. You saw him, Gedalia? After the, the Romans had, uh, had cleared out the land, they left a small Jewish community and they left the governor. And they said, listen, you, these two guys are planning to assassinate you. And he's like, I don't want to hear Lashon Hara. And they assassinated him. Just read the newspaper. And you yeah. How do you make a distinction? Like Miriam was coming from a good place because she loved him. So why? So why regarding Moshe Rabbeinu, questions? that listen, the, everything in the Torah is to teach us lessons. Okay. So when you're dealing with a a person on the caliber of Moshe Rabbeinu, and and they're so humble, so we have to assume that most of their 99.9% .9 is like the tip of an iceberg. 99.9% .9 of their greatness, we don't know. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right? So, um, so, uh, so now, Moshe, although he conducted himself like he was a rock or a tree, like he was humble, as humble as anything, he never stood up for his covenant, never promoted himself, never let anyone even know his madrega. He conducted himself like the lowliest inanimate object. He wasn't. And the parallel here is Eretz Yisrael also isn't. So be very, very careful about speaking Lashon Hara Eretz Yisrael, which we're going to see is an actual halacha. So then what happens? Now we get deeper. So we, what happens when we impose our story upon someone else, our particular point of view, okay, which is generally never going to be 100% right, because we don't know everything about any, right? So we expose, what happens is by speaking Lashon Hara, we think we're exposing someone else's shortcoming, but actually we're exposing the deficiency, the mediocrity of our own lens, right? We think we're exposing someone else. Oh, you know, they're not who you think they are. But really, all we're doing is exposing how uh, deficient we are and how under-evolved spiritually our lens is. So we can't give someone the benefit of the doubt. We can't be gracious. We can't realize that there's a lot of that nobody's perfect and all. And uh, yeah. I just saw in a mug or something somewhere. We don't see things as they are. We see things as, as we, we are. are. Now, exactly what, what uh, Miriam gets saras when you get so exact. I mean, you know, that's right. We see things as we are. Miriam gets saras. Okay. What is so? First of all, what saras? It exposes the fact that you got a problem. <laughs> you have a problem. In addition to that, Rabbeinu Baha'i says, and I brought this down about a couple months ago in a shir, that Rabbeinu Baha'i explains the idea that when we speak Lashon Hara about somebody, we don't just have a problem. We get all their problems. All their averus are thrown onto our scale, thrown into our bag. And all our zchuyos are transferred to them. We take on all their sins, all their short. Rabbeinu Bechai explains it. I'll bring it. It's in one of the old shirim. It's in the shir about Golis, which we're going to get to, the shir about Golis that we did about Tisha B'Av, Ligalot. We take on all their sins, and we forfeit all our mitzvahs to them. We don't, Taras doesn't expose to everyone, hey, you have a problem. It's a problem that's on you, Okay. It, uh, it says, not only do you have a problem, you don't have a problem, you have your problem and their problems right now. All right? Now, what happens when you get to Ras? You have to go into Golis. You gotta go outside the Machne. You forfeit the privilege of community. But remember what we said back then from Ramesha, Zechon Levracha? The word Galut is Ligalot. Lashon Hara leads to Golis. What is Golis? Ligalot. It's the, the sin of Golis is trying to expose the other person's shortcomings, weaknesses, failures, imperfections, hypocrisies, human flaws, okay? Gullus, the sin of Gullus, the, the essence of being, you know, disconnected is when we spend our, our we, we waste our koach hadibor on exposing other people's flaws. Because exposing other people's flaws means that we are we, and our lens, if that's what we like to do, and that gives us satisfaction, and we like to bring everybody else down because it makes us feel better, whatever it is, it shows us the way we look at people, the way we look at people, the way we look at ourselves. That's who we are. 
But Lashonara isn't only coming from a bad place. Sometimes it's not your intention is not to put somebody down. Sometimes your intention is, is that you are confused. to be confused. You might be confused. You might say, um, "Wow!" For something to be qualified as lashon hara, this is an important point. Latest point is important. For something to qualify as lashon hara, it has to have, it has to do damage, a pr- loss of um, parnasa, loss of, of uh, a relationship, loss of a, of a, of a. Um, you know, like a job, you know, somebody went on an interview, loss of a job, loss of reputation, loss of money. It has to have damaging effects. And Lashon is not, it is not Lashon Hara when it's a toelis, it's fundamental, it's important to save a person from being deceived or harmed. That's not Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara is when you spin your story that then has an absolute quant- quantifiable damaging effect on someone else, all right? And it's your story. It's not. It's not the. It's, it's not well, if objective. You're trying to work something out. For instance. Well, if you talk to somebody to help you get a better perspective, right. Right. so you tell them something. Right. One person who's not allowed to be macabre your story. Okay, they're allowed to hear the data if the data is factual. Often the data is not even true. All right, but if the data is really true, they can hear you're you're struggling with the situation, but they're not allowed to believe your spin on it because it's your spin. Yeah, it's so interesting because we're looking at the media today. Yeah. Everything is done through their lens. Yeah, of course, yes. Channel. Yes. <laughs> Here is the, the upshot of it all. The message is with, um, it's, I mean, that is, uh, all marketing is, you know, it's all creating a lens. Uh, and uh, the, the, the message is like this. When all, all Lashon Hara is based on MS, Okay, it's based on some facts, some data, something that happened. All right, that's true. But how, what we do with that, that's our problem. All right, different people are more developed in Ruchnius. Do they? They see. They don't jump to the worst possible conclusion about the data. And remember, exposing someone else's shortcoming is exposing our own. That saras boom ends up right on us. And now, what happens when it becomes obvious? When we're at such a place where we're so biased, we're so vind- angry, we're so subjective, we have such a personal agenda that we take the data and the story we spin is so, is over, you know, above and beyond what could be properly interpreted with this data, then everybody discounts it anyway. They say, oh, you're overreacting, this isn't what's going on, and then the Shekhar has no more rug lime. On a cosmic scale, okay, all the other attempts to establish a lifestyle, you know, government, government's rules, what's right, what's wrong, look at today, look at what's going on today, with all the, you know, with all the um, demands, legally, legally, they're making demands that we accept as, you know, without judgment, lifestyles and, and behaviors and that, uh, that, that they've determined, somebody's determined, makes us better people to be less judgmental about things and let, have less standards and not allow any distinctions. You know, there's a, somebody just told me a story. Her friend's son, not Jewish, in a public school in um, the Upper West, the Upper East Side, um, was in a bathroom, a, male, a man's bathroom, and a girl walked in, the eighth graders, because she felt like a boy that day. And, um, <laughs> and he said, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with you being in here. And she's like, well, I'm not comfortable, you know, going to the girl's bathroom. So guess who got detention? He did. He did. He did. All right. So, um, so, the, so, this. So there's there's good in there's good in when something gets extreme to the point of crazy and wrong and dangerous and harmful and stupid and not reality, then that's when it wears itself out. That's when everybody says, "Oh, come on already, enough is enough." But it has to get to the point of such extreme sheker. That it's a, it's clear to see that there's no more yeah, MS then, in it. Even then, it, it can be. I mean, this morning I heard that Mother's Day is now Male Mom's Day too. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a male mom, you can get right. to celebrate. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The hol- okay. So basically, what this means is, don't. Sh- when it gets crazier and crazier and crazier, that's a sign. It's almost over, okay? It has to be, be above and beyond, completely 
devoid of any MS, and then it's over. It played itself out. So he says, when is Mashiach going to come? When all of these governments, every leadership, every way of life imposed by law, by the government, is so, it reveals itself to be ridiculous, and with nothing normal anymore to prop it up, then it's over. Now, the halacha I want to end with here is, it is, and I'll give you a, a, one quick story, the covered Eretz Yisrael. It is forbidden to say Lashon Hara about the land of Israel, its fruits, its people, or any other aspect. And this is wow. hard, because everybody, there are group, Eretz Yisrael, like the Meraglim said, it's a tough land. Okay, with the external threats, the, everybody is always, everybody in Eretz Yisrael, pretty much, I mean I'm generalizing, but is always on the alert for the next serious threat to their existence, mm -hmm. to their lifestyle, to the legitimacy of them even being there, being or being a Jew or even existing at all. That constant like being on alert for all the threats against us, it seeps in and they're on alert against each other. You know, everybody's on alert against the other one who's trying to destroy my lifestyle and trying to impose and and the passions run high and people do crazy things in Eretz Yisrael. And we're like, how religious, they're not religious, in between everybody's like, what are you guys doing? What is going on here? And we, of course, sitting in America, like like are horrified when we see a lot of this stuff and we're like and it's hard not to pass judgment on all the different groups in Eretz Yisrael, from the extreme right wing Haredi groups to all the left-wing groups and everybody in between, it's hard, and the settlers, and I mean everybody there, it's hard not to pass judgment. And it's hard not to take that data and, you know, and have, be very angry and speak Lashon Har. There's a special halacha that is us to speak Lashon Har against our soul. I tell you so, when my grandfather and my grandmother came to visit when I was in seminary, and, um, and uh, they were visiting, and it was raining, in the rainy season, Eretz Yisrael. And I said at some point, I go, oh, the weather's horrible. So my grandfather looked at me and he said, Esther, don't you ever speak Lashon Har about the weather in Eretz Yisrael. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Yeah. And, uh, Rebbe Yerushalayim. Rebbe that's right. In fact, when I went to Eretz Yisrael, I went to my uncle Mordechai Zechonu Levracha, one of the Lamed Bav Tzadikim of the, the previous generation, literally, one of, the, one of them. And uh, I said, oh, Uncle Mordechai, can you give me a bracha? And he says, Re'e Batuv Yerushalayim. Mm -hmm. Only see the good in Yerushalayim. And now that goes for the so-called inanimate parts of Eretz which are not inanimate, Kal uh, you know, and I fail in this a lot. We all do. We, pay, you know, we make our speeches at the people of Eretz What's fascinating, though, is Eretz Yisrael Yeah. And um, But it's almost like Eretz Yisrael has arrived when Jews were not populated. <laughs> it's you know, a very nice point. Where, where, where Mark Twain called it the desolate land. It's very it nice. La, 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 until the Israel came back and made it our own, and now we see it blossoming. Yeah, it's blossoming. It is. It's an amazing thing. Esther, what is the source for this halacha? So 